Bob Work, and I'm here to discuss how technologically enabled offset strategies can help a competitor gain and maintain a major advantage in war fighting, thereby either helping them deter their adversaries or improve the likelihood they might defeat them in battle. Now, I know what you're thinking, or at least some of you are thinking. Holy moly work, you've got to get a new shtick. If I have to listen to another story about the third offside, I'm going to get physically sick. But rest assured, I am not here to talk to you about us offsetting anybody. Because as I watch the ongoing military technical competition in the Western Pacific and between our two great power rivals, especially China, I find myself saying, so this is what it feels like to be offset. And I got to tell you, it doesn't feel very good. Because make no mistake, after reviewing what the Chinese military has been able to do in the last two decades and what they are planning to do in the next decade, any objective assessment, in my view, must conclude that the U.S. Joint Force is perilously close to being the victim of a very patient, exquisitely targeted, and robustly resourced, technologically driven offset strategy. So strategically, we're entering uncharted waters. Since the end of World War II, the United States has generally been the power that has been offsetting the quantitative superiority of our adversaries. And we've done so from a consistent position of technological superiority. But in China, and to a lesser degree Russia, we are dealing with competitors that are keenly focused on offsetting our technological superiority, even as they strive for technological parity and eventually technological superiority. Now, as we consider the ongoing strategic competition with these two great powers, Russia and China, it's important that we clearly understand what is happening before our very eyes. Now, this is a picture, you see many of them like this. It depicts the Chinese anti-access area denial network in the Western Pacific. But A2AD, anti-access area denial, is just a term. And it's accurate as far as it goes. It's designed to keep us from being able to project power. But it doesn't, it's an outcome. It doesn't describe the strategy that led to it. And that strategy is the subject of this talk, again, with a particular emphasis on China. Let's start by rewinding the tape just a little bit. Although China was a de facto strategic partner of the United States during the last two decades of the Cold War, in December 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, any time a great power is looking at its potential rivals, it says, who is the pacing threat? Which power is the pacing threat? And so with the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States, by default, just became the pacing threat. Didn't mean that the Chinese felt that war was inevitable, just meant that their capabilities would have to try to be able to keep pace with the pacing threat. And accordingly, in 1993, with America's dominant performance in Operation Desert Storm in the first Gulf War, President Jiang Zemin directed the People's Liberation Army to prepare for local wars under high technology conditions. And he didn't have to say which adversary represented the most likely potential threat. Now, Chinese plans took far greater urgency in 1996 during the 1996 Taiwan Missile Crisis. Now, in response to Chinese missile tests over and into the waters surrounding Taiwan, the United States mounted the biggest naval show of force in Asia since the Vietnam War. In fact, they sailed a carrier battle group and a large deck amphibious ship through the Straits of Taiwan, thereby demonstrating in vivid fashion to the Chinese leaders and the Chinese people that China was incapable of stopping a U.S. intervention in the case of an attempt to forcibly bring them, into the, uh, bring them under the fold. Now, this incident had a profound impact on Chinese thinking. 
it's impossible to say just how profound an impact it was. And according to Rand, Chinese military spending increased by 620% in the two decades after 1996. And since 2015, these increases have been proceeding apace. Now, any time, ladies and gentlemen, in a strategic competition that one of the rivals puts that amount of defense spending towards its military uh, capabilities, you're going to see some dramatic improvements. But when they are targeted with precision to offset the advantages of the potential rival, the improvements are strikingly more effective. And as one reviews and considers the precise and disciplined investments the Chinese military has made since 1966, they appear to me to reveal five reinforcing legs of an extremely coherent offset program targeted at the United States. Now, I want to make clear the Chinese do not refer to their activities as an offset strategy, but I'm here to helpfully do it for them. And there are five mutually reinforcing components of this offset strategy that I'll go through quickly for you. The first is industrial and technical espionage on a broad scale. The second is an emphasis on what Chinese military theorists call system destruction warfare, to be described. Doctrine and weapons that seek to allow the Chinese military to attack U.S. forces effectively first, to be explained. Secret, secret assassin's mace capabilities, that's the Chinese term for what we call black capabilities, very highly secretive protected capabilities. And the fifth is exploiting artificial intelligence for military superiority. Now in the late 1990s, when the race started, when the bell rang and the race began, Chinese military planners knew that the United States enjoyed unquestioned technological superiority over them. If you take a look at all of the writing in this period, it began to explore and emphasize ways in which a technological inferior could defeat a technologically superior adversary. But one obvious goal of the Chinese offset strategy was to close that technological gap. And they wanted to do it as quickly as they possibly could to put the Chinese military on an equal footing with the United States. And thus, with the benefit of hindsight, it seems to me that the long-term offset strategy had three what we would call conditions-based phases. Phase one would necessarily see the Chinese compete with the U.S. from a position of technological inferiority. They recognized it, they admitted it, they said, how do we keep the United States from taking advantage of us during this period? Phase two would occur when the Chinese military capabilities achieved rough technological parity. If you do that between great powers, your deterrent posture is immediately elevated and your conventional deterrent is immediately strengthened. And phase three would represent the desired end strength, where the Chinese military would actually compete with the United States from a position of outright technological superiority. Now, given America's initial lead in 1996, it was enormous. China's ability to get to phase two and phase three would depend a lot on how focused the United States was on what China was doing in the technological realm, and how rapidly the United States would respond to what they saw China doing. And it would also depend on how successful the first critical component of the Chinese offset strategy would be. And this is industrial and technical espionage. This is just one of many reports that have been written on this subject. But as they say, this strategy is a deliberate state-sponsored effort to circumvent the costs of research, to overcome Chinese cultural disadvantages, and to leapfrog to the forefront, leveraging the creativity of other nations. Quite a clever strategy. 
Now, you've all seen this, or you've probably heard it just past week. U.S. government officials reported another penetration of a U.S. defense contractor where China was able to exfiltrate to take away a trove of sensitive data on undersea warfare capabilities, one area where the United States enjoys complete superiority right now. And this is just the most recent reminder of one of the most widespread and successful technological espionage programs in history. And without question, this effort has allowed the Chinese to feel advanced technical capabilities much faster than the U.S. intelligence uh, community projected in the late 90s and early 2000s. Now, the second leg of the Chinese offset strategy is more operationally focused. And it is informed by what, what they believe to be the key aspect of high technology warfare. That's the Chinese term. Now, since Desert Storm, the Chinese military theorists see high technology warfare as a collision, as a duel between what the Chinese refer to as operational systems and what the United States refers to as a battle network. And this slide is a Soviet slide. They saw it exactly the same way, a duel between these operational systems. Now, the duel would play out between the four grids that any battle network would have. A sensor grid that's looking in the battle space and trying to figure out what's going on. A command, control, communications, and intelligence grid that tries to make sense of all of the data that's coming in. Try to make operationally relevant decisions to try to achieve advantage and then ordering the forces to carry out these uh, um, decisions. Then there is an effects grid to apply kinetic and non-kinetic effects as directed by the C3I network with an emphasis on conventional guided munitions. Munitions that can hit their target when fired. And then a grid to sustain forces and regenerate combat power. Now, Chinese military planners believe that high technology warfare is no longer centered on the annihilation of enemy forces. They do not think like the Soviets did, where you're trying to crush the forces and destroy them all. It will be won by the first side that can, in their words, disrupt, paralyze, or destroy the operational capability of the enemy's operational system. Thus, even as they began to build their anti-access area denial network with Chinese characteristics, they aggressively pursued weapons, capabilities, and effects that were focused on the United States battle network and its ability to actually put it together. Now, the Chinese have a word for this, and it is their theory of victory. It is called system destruction warfare. And this describes the second leg of their offset strategy. In their own words, the key thing that systems destruction warfare designs to do is to cripple the enemy's operational system, its command system, its weapon systems, its support systems, and the internal links that connect them. Destroying these links are going to result in the enemy carrying out isolated attacks rather than a concerted attack, and it would thus degrade the enemy's overall capabilities. In essence, then, the Chinese see system destruction warfare as the means by which they hope to achieve victory, and they do this by achieving information superiority, prying apart the U.S. battle network and maintaining their own. And they consider this to be the most important operational method of modern wars, achieving information superiority. And in their view, the precondition for achieving supremacy in the air, at sea, in space, and on the ground. Now, their emphasis on uh, system destruction warfare also explains their extraordinarily heavy investments in counter battle network capabilities and what they call informationalized warfare, like those shown on the screen. It's a combination of electronic warfare systems, cyber, and computer attack systems, counter space capabilities to knock down our communication satellites, 
and our intelligence satellites. All of them are designed to destroy the inner workings of the U.S. battle network. Now, the third leg of the Chinese offset strategy complements the second by seeking a clear advantage in a salvo competition, in a competition where both sides are throwing large numbers of conventional guided munitions. Now, the first rule of guided weapons warfare is to attack effectively first, because any leaker through the defense is likely to hit the target and achieve effects on target. So if you fire first, you gain an enormous advantage. And one way to do this, of course, is to wage system construction, uh, destruction warfare, and that would give the Chinese an advantage in looking deep, deep into the Pacific, and shooting deep at U.S. and Allied forces deep into the Pacific. Now, the, what, another way to do this is to achieve operational initiative through surprise, preemptive first strikes. We just have to prepare for eating the first salvo. That puts an enormous burden on U.S. and Allied forces. And then they want to use concentrated attacks whenever possible afterwards. Chinese military planners talked about the Iraqis firing Scud in Desert Storm, and they said they were firing Scud missiles like they spray pepper. And that wasn't a good thing. So what they say is concentrate your targets, fire in big concentrations, overwhelm the defense, get through the defense, especially against key point targets like command centers, communication hubs, and information processing centers. Now, if one's operational strategy revolves around attacking effectively first, it also makes sense to try to outstick your opponent. That's defense speak for having weapons that have longer range than your adversary. The Chinese clearly get this. This slide compares the ranges of all Chinese anti-ship and ballistic cruise missiles on the top of the slide. The bottom of the slide has all of the U.S. anti-ship ballistic and cruise missiles. And the implication is pretty clear. And a fleet on fleet engagement, and of course people will say, well, that's not really the way it would happen, but for purposes of here, the U.S. Navy would have to be under repeated attacks before they could bring their own weapons to bear. And that's not an enviable spot for any Navy to be in. And I could show you slides for air-to-air -air weapons and air-to-ground weapons that would tell similar stories. Now, firing mass long-range strikes is only part of their plan to attack effectively first. Another important part is to field weapons that are more difficult to defend against, that have a higher probability of penetrating an adversary's defenses. Now, this slide, we were hoping to have a video, but this explains why we would go after a missile like the SSN-22 Sunburn. It was a Russian-made missile specifically designed to defeat the best combat system the U.S. Navy had, the Aegis combat system. At the top of the slide is a target barge. The bottom of the slide is the same target barge after being hit by an SSN-22. It also explains why they go after advanced seekers that our electronic warfare capabilities just can't get to, like millimeter wave systems. But the key decision, the key decision, without question, was they're going to go after ballistic missiles for their primary kinetic effector. And it's not hard to understand their thinking. First, ballistic missiles are generally tougher to kill than airplanes and cruise missiles. Not in all cases, but generally that is the case. A ballistic missile force is less expensive to build and maintain than a high-quality air force, and that is the primary U.S. means to deliver long-range effects. They said, let's not compete with the U.S. Air Force, except in very niche ways. Let's go after ballistic missiles. They exploit a competitive asymmetry. They know the United States is the signatory of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, which limits our land-based missiles to 499 kilometers. Since the Chinese are not signatories, they can build as long-range missiles as they possibly can. And in a range competition, it is much easier to make ballistic missiles with the farther range than it is to increase the range of manned aircraft. And finally, Chinese doctrine, fire first effectively, overwhelm an enemy, surprise strikes. It's much easier and quicker to assemble ballistic missiles and fire a salvo 
than it is to marshal all of the tankers and the airborne command and control and all of the airplanes that would have to be used for a strike. In other words, you have less indications and warning that you're going to be attacked. And now by adding hypersonic and hypersonic glide vehicles to the equation, they're introducing weapons that are even harder for us to defend against because they exploit an operational domain called near space, above 100,000 feet where airplanes can't fly, below about 320,000 feet where spacecraft can't stay in orbit. And it is an operational domain that we don't have a lot of sensors to cover or effectors, ballistic missile effectors, to shoot them down. Now these are the first three legs of the Chinese operational, I mean, offset strategy. They're very clear for us to see. We can actually see them fielding forces like this. And this is consistent with any offset strategy. Generally, what you want to do is reveal capabilities to deter your potential adversary. But you want to hide, you want to conceal capabilities that might give you a warfighting advantage in the early days of a fight. So as President Xi himself has said, quote, advanced technology is the sharp edge of the modern state. It has been aptly put that the sharpest weapons should not be revealed. So they're following our playbook all along. And they call these black capabilities assassin's mace. Sometimes you hear Project 99-5. That's May of 1999 where the Chinese said, hey, the U.S. bombed our embassy in Belgrade. We're going to start some of these high technology things. And they might include directed energy weapons. They might include advanced space weapons. They might include electromagnetic rail guns. Or even more exotic weapons. We don't know. Hopefully they're, um, they're trying their best to protect these capabilities. So we should be prepared to be surprised if, God forbid, deterrence fails on both sides or a miscalculation occurs and we find ourselves in a military fight. Now, each of these four initial components of the strategy, you can go back to late 1990s and you can say, wow, I can track all of the things they're doing. However, they added a new fifth component, one designed to speed up its temporal pace. And on July 2017, China's State Council published the Next Generation Artificial Intelligence Development Plan, which says by 2030, China will lead in this era and it is going to lev be leveraged for both competitive advantage and military advantage. So in this regard, the Chinese believe that AI, big data, machine, human, hybrid intelligence, swarm intelligence, robotics, all of this is going to trigger a new military technical revolution. They want to be a first mover in that revolution, like the United States was a first mover in the conventional guided munitions revolution, and they think that is the way they will get ahead of the United States at a much faster timeline than they envisioned. Well, that's it. About 20 minutes or so of what it's like to be offset by a pretty technological savvy strategic competitor, the likes of which the United States has never seen. They've been following and refining this three-phase offset strategy, robustly resourcing it for over two decades. They've shown patience, they've showed discipline, they've showed innovation, and they've showed adaptability. And now we have clues to suggest how they judge themselves along their phasing timeline. Six years ago, President Xi told the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, by 2020, you need to be able to forcibly invade Taiwan. Well, I can't imagine they would say that if they thought they were going to fight from a position of technological inferiority. So it is a hint that they think that they are going to achieve technological parity with us around 2020. And the AI plan says, we hope to surpass the United States by 2030. So, things aren't going all that great. These timelines seem a little bit over, uh, optimistic to me. The US military is the most formidable military technological competitor that the world has ever seen. But as Chairman Joe Dunford says, Hey, our competitive advantage against both China and Russia is eroding, without question. And along with it, our credibility for conventional deterrence. And so we need to start taking dramatic steps, in my view, to restore it. So I actually regret talking about the third offset strategy in hindsight. I think it made it sound as though we had the advantage 
and we had the time to think about it and go through the motions. But this, the decision of the United States to become decisively involved in the Middle East came long before China and Russia emerged as big strategic competitors. And after 17 years of focus on irregular warfare and counterterrorism, it helped to obscure the challenges that the Chinese especially were presenting to the force. And both of the nations said, boy, this is a great thing, we're going to exploit it. So in hindsight, I wish I would have said, we need to start offsetting, upsetting the Chinese offset, which is coming uncomfortably close to achieving technological uh, parity with the United States. And it, their perceived success in doing so can be seen in the technical trend lines in the Western Pacific, their aggressive behavior in the East China Sea and South China Sea, and increasing unease among our Asian allies. Now, this is perhaps a more alarmist formulation, and maybe it would have triggered a more coherent response. I don't know. But the national defense strategy clearly says we're in this race. This race is one we have to win. So we, the United States has been like a thoroughbred. It broke from the gate, and it's been leading the race from the very start. But the, 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 we've been patiently stalked by two other horses, and they are at the end of the race, and they've got momentum. At this point, I would think that the outcome is too close to call. So it's time for the United States to crack the whip, and let's hope it's not too late. Now, what's going to happen is Missy Ryan is going to lead a panel and going to talk about how we might respond to this technological offset strategy and hopefully other things. But I thank you again for coming to the uh, conference, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.